Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the elf bar of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am the death metal guy, a.k.a. Black Metal's dead. I didn't even know it was sick. (laughs) (laughs) It's, uh... It's fucking sick, man. (laughs) Exactly. Moss Brutal. (laughs) Um, And I am the black metal guy, a.k.a. Everyone's so worried about, you know, like, the economy, the election, global warming, uh, Russia and Ukraine, Jeffrey Epstein and his connections to Chase Bank, uh, Chicago organized crime at Iran-Contra. But what we should really be worrying about is cloning the mammoth. (laughs) <laughs> we have everything we need to clone the fucking mammoth, and those poor guys are still rotting under the tundra. I think that's completely unreasonable, and I'd like for you to make a petition on change.org that I can sign under a funny name. Excellent. <laughs> All right, guys. We uh, Not a lot of preamble. You can see the title of this episode. We got a lot of fucking records to go over. So, real quick, social media, me. On Facebook, at Terminus Podcast. Him on Instagram, at Terminus Extreme Metal. Money, give it to us. Patreon, $3 and up. Terminus Prime bonus episodes, $5 and up. Access to the Terminus Black Circle. Our Discord server, where one of our members is celebrating the birth of his wife's new baby. So, congratulations. Aww. Hey, all This is Brandon from Cromley, and you're listening to Terminus. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with what will probably be, at least for our our regular dedicated listener base, one of the most exciting releases of the year. This is the follow-up to a record that placed very highly on my best of 2021, excuse me, 2021 list. And uh, 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 my esteemed co-host appreciated it very much as well with some more reservations than me. But uh, this one was a huge hit among Terminators. Yes, it is finally dropped the second album by Passeism titled Alternans, uh, released on Antic as always. <clears throat> so if you're listening to this show... Uh, you've probably heard the Passeism record already. It is very possible that the first Passeism record, Eminence, I have listened to more than any record we've ever covered on the show. Um, I have probably put a solid you know, 70 listens to that album or something. It's completely ridiculous. It's informed what I want to do on guitar. Uh, it's it's expanded me as a musician. It's just it's an all-timer for me. I'm always going to listen to that record. Um So I was definitely excited and curious to see if they would be able to top it with a sophomore release. And that is going to be kind of the the crux of this review in that uh, Passism, I believe, has surpassed the first album, but in an incredibly surprising way that I never would have anticipated. But uh, Black Metal Guy, I want you to uh, kind of refresh people on what some of your reservations were about the first one and... Uh, how you think this relates to some of those? Well, you know, with the first one, it was one of those classic Terminus reviews where we sort of, uh, where we sort of passionately debate the difference between, like, is this a, uh, you know, a, an excellent or masterpiece record, or is it just a very good or great record? <laughs> those are right? our most heated debates. It's not when it's, one of us likes it and one doesn't. It's when you don't like it enough. You know? That's actually, that's kind of, that's very true, yeah. <laughs> so I'm on, because then the stakes are high, right? Um, the uh, So I was more on the side of very good or great record, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I thought it was a... Uh, for people coming geographically, right, from Russia, not from France, it was amazing that they sounded so much like a part of the French scene, and particularly the Antic scene, which they now are functionally a part of, right? That's their mm-hmm. label. Um, and uh, they also had distinct characteristics. You pointed out a sort of dazzling technical ability that comes from Brutal Death Chops, mm-hmm. and that was put not just into fanciness but into uh brutality in the plane right and extreme speed right there was there was a lot of in a style that well i don't know there, there was a it, it's already a maximalist style and this sort of extreme um 
extreme intensity in the plane of a different kind uh, gave it this like death metal maximalism right mm-hmm. you know as fast as possible as as loud as possible Just, um, they, they they sound like they're, they're they're keeping in time but they sound like they're stumbling over each other like they're trying to move so quickly it's exactly awesome. it's ex- yeah that's another point and I think it's even more true about this record mm-hmm. there, there's excellent plane but it's not at all like too smooth right in, in fact, it's like, if anything, there's, like, plenty of room for them to, like, there's plenty of variation in the performance, right? I don't know if I heard a mistake, per se, right? But it's just pretty wild. Oh, yeah. Um, very live-sounding. Um, but the, um, I guess my main, re- uh, my main cri- criticism about it, or my main limitation was, uh, you know, in a genre that leans heavily on melody and harmony, those sides of the music seemed underdeveloped. Mm. That a, a lot of it was um, sort of stock French riffing performed at the highest technical level on a band level that just many other imitators can't imagine, right? Uh, performed on a very high technical level with an authentic sound, but like sort of stock melodies and both, and that the stuff that stuck out the most, the stuff that was, it, and it was in two kinds of ways, both in kind of like um, sort of epic power metal passages which were often some of the most memorable right but also the poppiest Mm -hmm. um and also in the fast stuff the basic it was like the um they carried the ornamentation of the style the decorative tendency so far that the the detail uh interfered with the basic forms of the riffs Mm-hmm. And uh, it it either didn't add much to what were standard melodic forms, or it just sort of detracted. It it cluttered it. Um, that's not to say. And the funny thing is, like that doesn't apply to the whole record. I remember there being stonker riffs that you know I thought were just totally first rate for the style, right? And I, I pointed that out then, um, and I, I that's still true. But so basically, I was like, eh, this is really cool. I think they're still developing their own voice and figuring out what riffing in this style means for them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and on this record, they have just knocked it out of the park. And in a yes. way, it was, <laughs> in a way that I like, I could have imagined like the better Passeism record or whatever then, and it would have sounded more like the last record. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no. This, because- is, this is a complete sidestep, and I like it better than the record I imagined. Yeah. It's it, this is I mean this is more up my they ended I ended up this ended up being more up my alley than I expected it would be right this is really cool oh yeah no it's um, it's formed in a way that is m- definitely more in your wheelhouse but is also it, it's just a, a natural sequel to the first one um you know the first record Eminence which you know I love to death is um is a an incredibly high energy incredibly catchy. Uh, very indulgent record, um, mm-hmm. and it, and it thrives off that. And in a sense, I think that you could argue that Passeism just like takes that style, that sort of like maximalist candy melodic black metal style, sort of to its apex. And it would have been easy for these guys to do Eminence Part Two. It's like let's do all those, but the riffs are even more complicated, and everything's mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. faster, and the production's bigger. And they don't do that right. at all. You know, instead, what Passeism does is they strip out a lot of the catchiest, most immediately pleasing and accessible parts, and concentrate on really deep, complex, extreme metal technique. The tone is uh, darker. It's still high energy, but there's a lot more tension in a lot of the harmonic voicing on this record. Um, And just the palette of, you know, colors that they're working with is massively expanded beyond even the very colorful first album. You know, there's, there's dour moments on this record. You know, there were no, there were no dour moments on Eminence. We were having too much fun cackling and you know beheading people in the fields. You know? <laughs> now there's now there's some space to breathe. So a lot of this might sound like oh you know the the band's maturing and slowing down. No, it's just as maximalist and fucking insane as the first album. <laughs> but and there are still plenty of bright colors. There are just other colors too. 
Yeah. Right. O- overall, it's just it's a much more well-rounded, developed record. And if this one doesn't get more attention on the band, I don't know what to say. But but chances are maybe it won't because it's not nearly as obvious a record. It took several plays of this for me to like really sink into the way songs flowed into and out of each other and some of these really labyrinthine song structures, which, as I'll get to, I think have a lot more to do with this band's death metal background, really, than it does black metal. Um, But one thing that I want to talk about that I think is so cool is that I don't think I've ever encountered a metal record where the mood to me was what I would call foppish arrogance. You know, there's like, mm-hmm. there's an Oscar Wilde quality to this album. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's sort of like, it's condescending and it's, it's stoic and it's strong, but it's also very witty and sort of sly and cunning at the same time. And that kind of extends to the album cover. You know, you have Dionysus there, mm-hmm. you know, with the comedy and tragedy mask. <laughs> Do you remember that Flamen record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I would say that was foppish arrogance, but in a different way because this is more. It's, this is a little more cynical, right? It's, mm-hmm. it, this is a little more world weary. I can see what you mean about Oscar Wilde, right? There's a certain kind of um, world weary cynicism to it, um, not in a bad way, right? as well it's as just, as well as that same streak of decadence from the first album. Yes, well, oh, that's a thing I w- wanted to say. I, I, I'm pretty sure I said in the first review that there were all these sort of like, you know, they were going for this kind of like manly, barreling, bright melody, but the fact that they were so overwrought made them kind of decadent mm-hmm. when, they, when, they, when it would have worked better as a more sort of uh, direct expression of power. In this record, it, it's almost like they were like, Okay, so our riffing is kind of decadent. Let's make that a strength, right? Uh, in, instead of in, instead of it being like a, a thing that's sort of s- noise in the signal of like you know broadsword, right? Let's recenter it around that, and the whole aesthetic has shifted, right? The cover art is medievalist, medieval-ish, but it's the medievalism of late nineteenth-century high culture, right? Mm-hmm. The Oscar Wilde reference is totally right. That's the English. They said they're influenced by French decadence, right? So like, uh, and you know, so by the you know poets and visual artists around the turn of the late nineteenth century. God, I mean, I I should I should rattle off a list, but really, you know, I'm not. I don't know that much about you know. I mean, Baudelaire's the starting point, but he's not even really. You wouldn't even really count him. Mm-hmm. Um, uh. But yeah, you can see it's like, it's this rich, overflowing, sumptuous tapestry art, but very much as the 19th century processed that. Yeah, yeah, a a very different take on what sort of indulgence looks like. Yeah, and it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of, um, you know, uh... It's a it's a dark indulgence. We could get into it later. It might take us too too far into abstraction right now. But basically, it's important that the figure on the front is is Pan, right? A Dionysiac uh, oh, okay. figure, right? Gotcha. Oh, I thought it was Dionysus proper, but it's Pan. Eh, it it could be. I, I mean, really, these figures bleed into each other in myth. But it's like Pan, or I think Silenus. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's but yes, it's the same idea, right? Ah. Uh, it's it's this anyway. You 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 probably had something you wanted to say about the Oscar Wilde thing, and I I sort of just threw out another example, and then we went on a tangent. Oh no, that was that was mostly it. It's just like this record has such a distinct mood, and kind of like you said in the notes, this really is the sound of passivism just sounding like themselves, because um, it's like as they've moved away from some of the core musical ideas that were present mm-hmm. on Eminence, this is still very much in the antique wheelhouse, but this actually sounds less like flourishing chivalric French black metal now. It really kind of just has its own weird space, which I really like. Um, well, let me uh, let me play some riffs first, mm-hmm. um, just so we can get into the meat and potatoes of how this music is structured. So uh, this is a really interesting album in that it is an album that is packed to the brim with huge, like, all-timer riffs, but it's not really a riffs album or a riff-based album. Um, There's a lot of huge riffs on the sample that I'm about to play, but nothing is really indicating to the listener, oh, here's the big stonker riff, because 
They all are, and none of them are. This is much more horizontal music compared to the first record that was all about these sort of like ornate spiraling lead guitar lines that you as the listener were just like wedded to. You know, that was the point of the record. Here, everything's a little bit more equitable amongst the instruments. And here is also where that kind of tech death pedigree comes out. Um, The riffs are just as complex as they were on the first record, but now they are longer and harmonically more rich. Um, There's just a ton going on at any given moment of this record. Uh, it's which makes it so difficult to process on your first couple plays. Um, so let's go to Rhapsodic Annoyance Chant, uh, the second track on the record. And I selected this part because this is one of the sections that's most similar to stuff like Eminence. But I think when you listen to it, you'll immediately hear the distinction. So that's like, I I think that's what, four or five riffs uh, over the course of that period? One thing that's interesting, so Eminence is a pretty long record. Uh, Eminence comes in at, oh, actually, no, Eminence is only 35 minutes long. So these are about the same. Just a lot going on. (laughs) Oh, yeah, no, Alternance feels very long, even though it's only about 35 minutes long again, but not in a bad way, just because the the sheer density of what's going on is so ridiculous. Um, But there we got to hear versions of Passyism riffs that we've heard on the first record. You know, the ones that kind of brush up mm-hmm. against oi punk stuff, but obviously just played way more intricately. Um, but you can tell that there's, despite how dynamic the first record was, it was dynamic within this one primary color of excess. Here, there's all kinds of crazy lopsided hybrid riff formations and, you know, just really elaborate lead lines that snake around in interesting ways and never resolve in the way that you think they're going to necessarily. The band's ability to stop on a dime and just pivot into a contrasting but fundamentally related idea is still here, but they've exaggerated that even further. Um, Listening to these songs is like breathlessly exciting in a way that not a lot of records are. And that's just so fucking cool. Even, like, listening to this, we were just like, oh, every time a new riff would come in, we were like, ooh, yeah. wait, so that's the big one. No, that's the big one. That's the big one. <laughs> yeah, man. Um. So that, yeah. I Do I have anything specific to say about that part? Um. Uh. Maybe... I mean, yeah, like, there's just, I, I like, that was a really good selection of a passage because pretty much everything there does compare to shit on the first record, right? Uh, and, yeah, the, the first record had very bright primary colors harmony. This is like that for the first mid-tempo riff. Yeah. Right? That, that is just very similar in rhythm and general shape to stuff on the first record, but it's 
you know, it's played with shades of gray and dark green and black, right? Like the cover art. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, uh, the, um, I mean, th- it, it moves through a, uh, it moves through a set of, uh, moving through those riffs, we get to the end and we finally get to two sort of more um, elongated uh, elongated riffs going into a blast that are really are a lot sort of a lot like what they were doing on the last record but where on the last record they sort of maybe you know for me the problem was they sounded a ton like vehemence but they weren't vehemence riffs mm-hmm. those just uh, just did like you know those were just A plus riffs in that style but way on the more uh solemn end of the spectrum in a way that very rarely occurs in their songs. Yeah. In and I think songs. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I was going to link that back to the death metal idea, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Oh, well, so it was, I was doing some reading about this record. Um, and uh, some things kind of fell into place for me, things that I hadn't considered with the first one. Um, one is that we can hear the way these songs operate is a lot more like a death metal band in a lot of ways. Uh, Passivism have no desire to like settle into something. Um, they want these really sharp, high contrast inflection points emphasized by a high level of technicality. Um, and in doing reading about this record, I found out that uh, Colin Marston was actually the engineer, and he also plays some of the keys on this record. Mm-hmm. Um, and immediately I was like, why did I never think of Kralis as a primary thing these guys would be interested in? Ooh. Well, it's well, it's like it's coming from an extremely technical extreme music background. It's moving into a sort of weird maximalist black metal, uh, with a lot of these strange primary color melodies and it's extremely modern. Um, now neither of us are big Kralis fans, but you can definitely see how guys from the tech death scene get really into that idea and start reworking it more in the traditional image of black metal to some degree. I can see how their tone is halfway between modern, you know, modern feudal black metal jangle and also drill bit. Yeah, yeah. Right? Everyone would talk about the Kralis tone. Um, the Kralis tone, which Liturgy sort of knocked off and exaggerated, right, as the drill bit guitar tone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this... These riffs do sort of uh, sometimes skitter around like that. Yeah, yeah, those, those or, really or crisscross we- each other in in that way. Yeah, those strange like spindly lead runs that are you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. constantly moving in weird directions. Um, okay, so let me go to another sample here. Uh, this is off the third track. Uh, ominous. I, I meant to look this word up, so I pronounce it cor- correctly. Is it bravure or bravour? I think it's bravour. You bravour. Know. Okay, we would so, say bravura, right? But yeah. Okay, so ominous bravour chant. Um, so the middle two tracks on this record, uh, ominous bravour and opulent sepulchre chant, are I think like designed to be a pair together, mm-hmm. and I think they're the best material on the record. Uh, they they form one enormous like twelve minute composition that is just. Operates on a scale well beyond anything Passyism has done before, and really no sampling does justice to the whole progression. But we're going to listen to a really cool point of progression on this track, where Passyism slows it down and gives the music a little bit more room to breathe, uh, and it's very rare for them, so it ends up being a really gripping moment. Additionally, I want to point this out because listening to this, I think that the riffs here are a specific and pointed pastiche of ideas from Ultra, from Spite Extreme Wing. I'm going to (laughs) die on this fucking hill. And just given how these guys operate and the kind of music they're producing, it wouldn't shock me at all for them to actually be listening to Spite, um, which, again, are another strange solar metal band who come from sort of an aggressive death metal background. Um, And I also picked this just because all the riffs are very pretty and neat.
Yeah, so that that <laughs> that main um, riff figure where we hear a bunch of variations, that sounds like directly pulled from Ultra Enemy. You know, it does sound like Ultra. I know what you're thinking. I'm actually going to disagree with you there, though. Uh, it, well, not disagree. It does sound like Ultra, but I think more immediately it sounds like Pest Noir. Um, that is true. It's just this is so much more technically elaborate than Pest Noir. I guess that's not where my brain went immediately. Pest, no, Pest Noir riffs are very fancy. That's the crazy thing about them. I, you know, the thing, it's much, it's fresher, you know, back in the day we were both contrarians and didn't listen to them very much, as opposed to mm-hmm. now when we're not contrarians and everything we say is simply the law. We are the norm. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, uh, like, you know, when I when we were reviewing the Grave Pilgrim record, right? Mm-hmm. I went back and listened to you know the the very first Pez Noir record, uh, and you know it, it didn't. We have this idea of them that's formed by Famine's later, much sort of more uh, deliberately oddball stuff, right? Um, but the the first one has a bunch of these ridic- ridiculously elaborate stomp riffs, um, and it sounds much more medieval. Uh, but it's also called pan- panegyric or panegyric de la dégénérescence, right? So it's already, <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's it's already about degeneration, decadence, right? Uh, yeah. And um, the refer- the whole reference is to decadent art and French, uh, sort of French eroticism, languor, malcontent. That's, Famine is a, a, like, a, he's one of the key people into that in mm-hmm. modern black metal. And, but also, if you go back and listen to that first record, it's really medieval. Right. Whereas if you listen to his later stuff, the medieval stuff is there in the background. Like, okay, yeah, he does, you know, he misses the Middle Ages, sure. But mm-hmm. mostly he's, you know, trying to hit that can with a baseball bat. Right? <laughs> um, the, uh, it's, it's, it's up front in the early stuff. And he, noticing that here made me realize, oh, KPN is really fundamental for this whole second generation of bands. Like, for Vehemence, too, in a way I didn't realize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's um, fair. You're just better acquainted with that stuff. Well, I, I looked. KPN and Spidex, we're going to be dealing on this episode, especially later, too, with a lot of just these formative bands from right when we were getting really into the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, who And so Ultra came out two years after uh, the first Pass Noir record. Um, mm, okay. And I think the shift to a more jangly tone could have been influenced by it, but I'm sure both those bands were listening to each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, wh- why don't you elaborate on the similarities to Ultra that you heard? Oh, well, it, Ultra, there's like... <laughs> I know it because I stole it from Ultra. <laughs> uh, so Ultra has a lot of these figures that are based off of these like um, <clears throat> suspended fifths, like uh, like a like a bar chord plucked out and arpeggiated, mm-hmm. uh, which is also a very sort of Western um, Ennio Marconi type thing. Mm-hmm. And I actually listened specifically to Ultra because I need an excuse to. And I think that it is like a specific thing. Um, there's like almost a pastiche of um, like the first and the third tracks, the the sort of jangliest, most Western riffs there. There's a way where you sort of bolt them together and revoice and you end up with something very close to this riff on alternates. Um, I just thought it was really neat. And it just given the kind of like similarity of trajectory between those bands, it just struck me as like, we're, I'm going to keep throwing those darts out there, baby. Someone's going to have listened no. to Spike Streaming one day. <laughs> we, we got we got to do it, man. I, I <laughs> death metal guy. Why don't you play us the riff? <laughs> okay.
okay, so do you do you get what I'm saying? It's sort of like if you if you pile all those variations together on the riff from Ultra, that's uh, from two on Ultra, mm-hmm. um, especially some of those descending fifth lines that 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 little legato turnaround toward the front on one of the variations. Mm-hmm. It, it, it seems like they're they're at least working with a lot of the same, like very much the same raw material. Yeah, I can hear that. It's sort of like if you took all of those ideas and played them twice as fast, four times as fast, it was yeah. a Kazaism riff, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah, which is, I mean, a, a good way of describing what makes Passeism cool, right? You can you contrast, you know, you, you were saying as you played the sample, right? Oh, man, I forgot how long this takes time this takes to develop, right? Mm-hmm. Uh to the extent that there's development in the Passeism record, it happens. Oh yeah, it's lightning fast. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I I hear what you mean. It's certainly cut from the same cloth. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but what did you what did you choose to highlight? Well, dude, I gotta say, I love this part. The part that you selected. <laughs> like, if if you hadn't done it, I would have done it. <coughs> but I so was cool. seriously yeah. considering sampling the entire. Uh, um, how long does it? 1936. I was seriously considering sampling the entire four minutes or like three minutes. So basically, one thing they do on this record that I love um, is that there is uh, the. Although you you said before they they never want to settle into something, mm-hmm. I, that's true. I think it was more true. Like I think the structures are more complex here. But there's also more of a willingness to just sit with certain ideas and concentrate their forces in certain places. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think, um, like, there's a... I think that the mid-tempo songwriting really... Having more mid-tempo riffs like this allows them to develop their own melodic voice uh, and to focus more on shape and harmony mm-hmm. uh, in a way that pays off in the faster parts. But, like, they repeat that fucking riff for four minutes, and it's awesome. And I wasn't expecting it at all. And it's not like, you're right, they never let it sit still, right? They, the kind of embellishment that you heard in that Spite Extreme Wing sample, kind of free open guitar playing, keeps happening, right? They mm-hmm. they don't They don't let that riff sit still. It's not, but it... But they use a technique that would be much more at home, that would be much more familiar from just, like, a pagan Hellfire record or something, right? Like, great, we're at the stomp part. Okay, four minutes, let's go. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they do that on a number of tracks, uh, and it speaks to a confidence in the basic building blocks of the riffs, um, right? We can commit to this. This is the one we're going to stay with, and I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, some of my samples highlight that, but um, yeah, yeah, both of them highlight it in in a way. But uh, I'm gonna sample from that track. I think you're right. Hearing the sequence from "Ominous Bravur" to "Opulent Sepulcher" yeah. was for the first time was really breathtaking. Um, because they just keep making these master stroke compositional moves. Uh, they I think you're right. This kind of are a sweet. Um. Uh, opulent Sepulchre, as the title suggests, right? So, you know, like a, a really extravagant tomb, uh, is a little more on the uh, melancholic or uh, or grim side. Um, but uh, here you'll hear some of that opening up in mid-tempo parts. Uh, and then we'll get to some other influences. Yeah. 
I, I love how I, I, you basically you, you sample pretty much the climax of the whole album there. Um, you, you know that that huge stately riff that they actually sink into for a while, and then that riff ends. And that would be a great point for them to just put long pause before they start up again. Fuck no, like two beats, and then they're racing off with another huge tech riff. It's so cool. Oh man, that that last yes, the last riff is a great example of how good the fast riffs are on here. Mm-hmm. Um, that has there's an example of all the detail uh, working to the strength of the riff, right? Uh, every little uh, every little bend and complication. Uh, I don't know. I, it, it's all, I, I guess, without getting too autistic about it, it's all really meaningful detail. It, and it's all, it's all propulsive. It, like, all the, all the extra shit in it makes it faster, and it doesn't distract from the basic form. I, I understand. Now I understand what you were talking about with the first record a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, I'm glad that makes sense. Yeah, it, yeah. Makes, it makes more sense now with this, this context given. Yeah, no, it's like the... Unless you're really there for exactly that kind of thing, Eminence can kind of drown under the weight of its detail. It's just, for a person like me, it's just like, that is like the thing that I like most in a black metal riff, so it was okay. Right, right. right. And here you just get this like dizzying blend of just forward aggression and just pulse. This kind of nimble, they're like dancing from emphasis to emphasis on that riff. It's insane how they fit so many notes there, which I'll talk to about on the next sample. But, um... Yeah, so but let's talk about that mid tempo riff, right? Do 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 Yeah, it's in well yeah, it's in a it's in like a three four waltz time configuration. Yeah. It's a three four waltz time, but it's turned also it's framed within that sort of insistent four four or downbeat. It's still got kind of like a bulldozer vibe. Um and what it really sounds like, I'm sure you'll agree, is Swedish melodic death metal. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. And so that's another influence you get more on this record. So by stepping back from their immediate influences and friends in the modern French scene, right, and uh, reaching towards maybe Pest Noir and Spite Extreme Wing and things like that, these early 2000s masters, uh, uh, they're developing a more original voice, and they're doing that by moving even further back to the 90s, too. This record has a much more vital connection to the classics of black and death metal. Yes. Uh, and, um, which makes it all the stronger. Uh, and so, uh, if I had to find one reference from that scene, I would, for this record, I'd say Dark Tranquility. Uh, it's through the fast parts on this record have the sort of frantic energy, the breathless energy of their first record, mm-hmm. and the kind of spidery, not in a bad way. Like the what was the word you were using? Um, I said skittering. The, the, the sort of the way the leads, um, the the way the leads are spindly, but not in a bad way, right? Oh, oh yeah, they, it was just like spiraling. You know, you know I always describe it as yeah, spiraling. spiraling, sort of. Yeah, g- glistening crystalline lines tracing all over the place in elaborate ways while also yeah. sounding like thrash metal or whatever, the, the, right? The primary, the primary element of passeism is air. Yes, air, right. And aesthetically, they work a lot with line. Mm. Um, and Dark Train, you know, so the, um, you know, the sort of like, simul- the sort of, ragged technicality in early dark tranquility but that big sort of barreling three four riff that that that's just so much more grim than the stuff around it uh mm. that also could just be like off the gallery or off a cataton or like an october tide record or something or yeah or even um lunar strain by in flames mm-hmm. the first one yeah or like um or just a a really depressing part on a spite extreme wing record um, yeah yeah like a non yeah, core part th- yeah. there's also also, and that section starts with this really cool sort of breakdown, halftime breakdown with those big arcing leads, uh, and the the leads again could be an uh, dark tranquility thing, could be a monomarth leads, right? Just low, just sort of centered uh, lower string death metal leads, mm-hmm. and it played in a very, very melodic way. So there's 
there there's a deeper background for this record that comes through everywhere um and it's accessing uh you know um exactly the kinds of uh majesty i want to hear on a black metal record <laughs> yeah I, I i i had a feeling when i first heard this because i was like waiting for the midnight drop on this one <laughs> um <laughs> I remember as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, this is going to solve all the problems that you had with the first one. Yeah, man. This record is awesome. It, it, <laughs> I, it, I love yeah, it. It's That's, funny because yeah. it's like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like more like a black metal record artistically and spiritually, but somehow like even further from it in terms of like it's, it's uh, technical vocabulary. Yeah. Which I, is interesting. I get, I get what you mean. Yeah. These, these songs are written much more like death metals songs and in a way we both get more of what we wanted to hear from them um, yeah uh this is um and certainly more of what's unique about this band um so uh second sample focuses on some of the same things but maybe in a different order uh so this is the last track and sorry i'm gonna give away the end if you're like the kind of person who cares about spoilers uh, <laughs> you know i'm sorry to tell you that dumbledore dies at the end um but uh no, we, um, this is, uh, another good example of commitment to the riff, uh, so we'll lead with that, but there's plenty to talk about here, so this is from the, this is just a triumphant way to finish a record, and very, it's a, you know how, you, you drew my attention to the idea that bands these days often don't know how to finish an album. Mm-hmm. And maybe I overlooked that at first because I was like, well, a lot of records I like just stop. But that's like deliberately, that's really primitive stuff, usually. Yeah. And the more we've done this show, the more I've been like, the death metal guy is right. There's really an importance to that for a lot of records. And in this kind of like extremely advanced narrative songwriting, it matters. So these guys give a really rousing, just rousing, triumphant end to the record, but not how you think. talked about the importance of the bass on the the last record you brought mm -hmm. that up but it was really hitting me right there the level of rumble oh yeah yeah the the production actually took a huge step up on this one i think you could hear the bass more clearly on the last record but it's still really important that's in part because some of the guitar detail has been filled in or some levels of the guitar sound have been filled out um, yeah yeah there's a but, there's a more well-rounded production here and the vocals have been taken down a notch which is good they were a little bit too loud on the first one yeah, I like the sort of um, 
semi-atmospheric bellow. A lot of people, you, you were saying a lot of people don't like the vocals, but they're obviously wimps. Um, yeah, they can't, uh, they can't, yeah, oh yeah, an enormous man shouting is inappropriate for black metal, fuck oh, off. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry it's not a goblin in a tree. <laughs> um, I'm sorry this guy can fucking lift. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, that, yeah, I'm sorry this guy reminds you of somebody who gave you a noogie, right? Um, <laughs> but like, uh, but anyway, like, um, <coughs> <laughs> the uh um that 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 just that that just that riff at the end is so just so severe uh and um it's in a way it is a very triumphant way to end a record right it's it, but it is not like a sort of euphoric payoff like they would have done on the last one right this is this is more just like winning in an extremely gruesome way. This is a little one gash, and you're listening to Terminus. And we are back from talking about uh, what is the better lovemaking soundtrack, Power Electronics or Order from Chaos, <laughs> to um, review something that sounds kind of like both of them. Samoth's Grebeberg, out now on the... Ancient and mighty Hammerheart records. Um, so it's Samoth, not Samoth. Um, <laughs> and uh, Samoth is a band that, in our circles, is pretty well respected and well known. But our circles are, you know, like you know, sort of like ten angry dudes. So, um, the uh, it's uh, they're popular, especially with the uh. You know the 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 death metal underground wing of the scene and the Hessian firm guys, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, it is uh, it started out. You know, you you understood their earlier stuff as kind of what they would call Norsecore back then, right? Oh yeah, no, Samoth mm -hmm. was just a really sophisticated Norsecore band. Um, but we probably have to explain Norsecore, don't we? That's not even a term people use. We've we've talked about it a few times oh, okay. before, right? Gotcha. But like, yeah, you you can uh, you can remind them briefly. Yeah, so Norse Core was a, a sort of epithet that was lobbed at. It probably started with Marduk's Panzer Division, Marduk, and it extended through bands that were highly influenced by it. Just um, really dense blast beat, heavy warlike black metal, and they said it was Norse Core because it was Norse grind core. Um, this was. This was never a term used sincerely by people who made it, but they should have because Norse core is fucking sick, and I won't let anyone tell me anything otherwise. Yeah, I, what do I what do I like? Things that are Norse and things that are core. Yeah, I like uh, a black metal record that's half an hour long and is blast beats at two eighty four the entire time. Uh, that just sounds like Last Days of Humanity, and I like them a lot. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically, it's late nineties black metal trying to figure out where to go next and reacting against the you know uh, freely excesses that were coming in then by basically trying to compete on a plane with death metal maximalism while like rigorously adhering to black metal fundamentalist minimalism in the guitar, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, the interesting thing is Streed, the first Samoth record, actually comes out in the same year as Panzer Division. So That's it's crazy. Kind of part, of a sim <laughs> part of a similar tendency. Uh, and, um, and also, I think from the beginning, Samoth had a much more developed melodic dimension to the music. Uh, I've... I've I don't know the old stuff well. We, neither of us does. We should, but uh, I've listened to it, and the impression I got was that it was sort of like um, you could think of it as grinding Norse core bolstered by symphonic BM, or mm -hmm. vice versa. Symphonic BM performed in a way that was adequately black metal, in a way that it hadn't been since maybe the you know the earliest Emperor stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh it was fiercely technical, compositionally ambitious, but without ever abandoning the aggression at the roots of the genre, right? So a certain kind of uh, fan really latched onto it, but it's always been one of those word-of-mouth bands. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, we would like to help change that, um, if we can, with our extremely limited audience of fanatics. Um, uh, so, like... Uh, 
where to go with this? We we re, you know this is um, the core songwriter here is Jan Krutwagen, and we last year reviewed another record of his by Cake, and uh, we both really liked that one, and it ended up on the year end list, right? Yeah, for both of us. Mm-hmm. And how would you describe it? Uh, Cake is kind of like a it, it it hews pretty closely to the idea of bands like Beherit or Demoncy. Um, mm-hmm. hyper minimal, uh, very death metal influenced, primitive black metal that's big on like a, a, a genuinely sort of occult and yeah. weird atmosphere. And importantly, slow primitive black metal. Yeah, so very like drawing slow. down the moon, Beherit. And I mm-hmm. think, yeah, Demon Sea even more so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's core, there's still all this sort of, um, uh, um, there, there, there's uh, there's still some epic melody pent up in the chording, which speaks to his background doing things like Samoth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, Cake was really impressive as, you know, um, a record that is by a guy who's basically in the same generation as the first wave of Norse bands. <coughs> uh, just started his main thing a little later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... It, you know, uh, well into his career, right? Well into his, you know, in his later 40s, was producing just just uh, savage, bestial, regressive music. Yeah, it's um, awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I also heard some crazy shit about, like, what went into making that album. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the, um, this is, uh, so the Samoth record, Greba Berg, bears the mark of that. This is also a work of deliberate regression. You really couldn't call it, say, you know, calling it symphonic or whatever would not really be accurate. However, all of that uh, neoclassical melody <laughs> and, and, and really the master, more than that, the mastery of uh, high tension, uh, nasty but noble harmonies is all still here in a package that comes off a lot more just like the ultimate version of war metal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Samoth, uh, Samoth is categorically war metal. I don't give a shit what you guys have decided that that tag means nowadays. Samoth is war metal. <laughs> yeah, this is, if anything deserves that title, this is a war metal record. Uh, and the interesting thing is, although it has the kind of... Um, severe geometry and uh you know martial melodies that we like in bands like axis of advance or scythian or whatever right uh in this one wing of war metal it 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 really has all of the intensity the all of the just unhinged performance noise blasting intensity and uh percussive element of what people usually think of when they think of war metal Mm mm-hmm and um, so yeah, I don't know where. Do, I, do you have anything else you want to do to set this up, or do we want to get into the meat? Um, I mean, I guess just as sort of like a, a little bit of preamble. Um, Samoth has also been described by some people like very ast- unusually astutely for the average metal public as black death metal, and I think that is true. But uh, even though this is entirely within the uh, aesthetic wheelhouse of extremely necro black metal. There's a ton of like primitive death metal mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. that's super important, like you know, kind of master death strike type gestures all over this, as well as just a, a sort of like vicious atonality to a lot of the riffing mm-hmm. that I think comes directly from like actual grindcore. Um, there's there's riffs on here that are just straight grindcore riffs, and that really adds a ton to you know. We're we're making a <laughs> we're making a fucking record about war. It, it should be chaotic and dissonant, and not chaotic and dissonant in the ways that you're familiar with. It should be too fast with chords kind of sloshing around mm-hmm, too mm-hmm. quickly to recognize. You know, it mm-hmm. should feel like going over the trench. Um, this is a really cool album. It's insanely fast. It's one of the fastest feeling things that I've ever heard. Um, and it's just and just super gorked and unhinged. That's the thing. This doesn't bear any of the markers of kind of self-consciously eccentric music, Mm-mm. but it comes off as just like psychotic in a way that most yes. stuff doesn't. <laughs> this this would be in a sense this could be the first record. Sound yes. Put out. Yes. 
and it could have come out in 1999 if not earlier but it sounds completely uh of the concurrent moment and really far ahead of younger bands and uh you know you were talking about that vicious atonality and the really prominent death metal influence uh and you know there i think there's another band here that is uh fundamental to this style that's even closer to your heart uh so let's start on the first uh full-length track reichswald uh interrupting morbid angel riff go burr <laughs> Interrupting Morbid Angel Riff returns. Yeah, um, that's it, it, it's totally grotesque to bookend that big sequence with just that fucking riff. Oh, oh, oh my god, yeah. So um, it's a great example of what we mean by the like geometric or architectural sound in Morbid Angel. You're just mm-hmm. like moving through these horrifically dissonant intervals in this staggered way that um, uh, moves through vertical leaps. You can see it building an an ugly building in air. Oh yeah, um, it also it also sounds kind of like a sort of a stripped down, trimmed out version of like a Gorguts riff. You know the the super highly atonal stuff that they would do sometimes. That was just you know purely sort of geometric or serialist in inspiration. It, it reminds me of that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, no, that that makes sense to me. Um, and here, of course, it's played in a it just a more sort of physical and uh, mm-hmm. it's played in a more visceral way than really either of those bands. Like even the architectural image isn't really right for this, but certainly geometric, mm-hmm. uh, ugly geometry. And it um yeah, there's it's it's hilarious, right? There's this build up that sounds like um uh. Basically, there are a few... The structure there is really cool, right? We start on this Morbid Angel riff, and then we go into a... Something you might not expect to hear on a record like this, which is a thrash beat. Mm -hmm. Um, And over that are these riffs that are like... Just, you know, like the coolest early Emperor riffs. The ones that aged the best, and that don't sound just like spooky. Uh, Yeah, a lot of the riffing here is is rooted in very deliberately conventional second wave Mm -hmm. uh, uh, notation patterns. And so, but something he pulls out of it, say, there are all these moments on um, anthems, 
where uh, that have all this potential in them. Where under the proggy stuff, you get these just brilliant black metal riffs that are harmonized in a way that makes them sound like trumpets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes that happens on certain kinds of really necrotic pagan BM from Eastern Europe, right? Mm-hmm. You get trumpet sound. Yeah. But this is this is different. It's more deliberate. And the melodies are being composed to sound like military trumpets, yeah. right? It's like, the, it's like the keyboard fanfares on Emperor Records, but played on guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it relies on overtones and weird harmonies uh, and, and just cool, really cool guitar tone. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he's playing these just like awesome emperor riffs over a thrash beat, the way emperor would play them. Uh, there is, um, you know, uh, and then it just throws kind of arbitrarily into this just, just you know, basically like a hammer fist mosh breakdown, which <laughs> I guess we would probably compare to Ride for Revenge or any of the slow finish bands. Yeah. But you pointed out how how different the drumming under it is. Oh yeah, there's some really bizarre uh, d- something that was also present on the Kayak record uh, mm-hmm. was drumming decisions that seem based around like a very different perceived central pulse to the music. You know, mm-hmm. like one that's too fast or too slow. It's never like the same quarter note that you're hearing as the listener. Mm-hmm. Which means that everything's in time, but it's just stressed in a really weird, uncomfortable way. Which is a really cool technique. Just, you know, playing with the edges of this sort of subjective perce- perception yeah. of rhythmic center. We would normally expect, say, the, the drums there to get more spacious or to do a predictable double bass roll, right? Mm-hmm. With some syncopation and division. And instead, yeah, the bass is like steamrollering past the places where you think the emphasis is. Yeah. Um, the interaction between, you know, guitars and bass on the one hand and drums on the other throughout this record is just nuts. I like what you say, but it really sounds like they're playing to different emphases. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very disconcerting because yeah. it's like, especially when you've listened to so much of this music, you know exactly how things are supposed to sound. So it's it's kind yes, of amazing yes. that it's kind of amazing they're able to figure out ways to fuck with that perception, even after listening to you know twenty thousand records or whatever. That's true. Although this could have come out in the nineties, it is unencumbered by the inherited, basically thrash metal songwriting structures from that. Yes, yes, um, very much. It's uh. And it, yeah, it's like they told the drummer, okay, look, w- we love slow parts. We're going to go halftime occasionally. When we do that, you can't slow down. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, which is which is really cool. Um, for a song, and, and so the other thing about thrash, right? Thrash is important on this record, but always as a always as a source for techniques rather than a structuring principle, right? It's not dictating the song structures and we don't have to do certain kinds of rote, boring, thrashy things. Someone in the comments, I think, perceptively compared this to Angel Corpse. I can really hear the similarities. But obviously the uh, the, the the sort of harmonic depth and the melodic reach on this is way beyond Angel Corpse. And Angel Corpse is devoted, really devoted to the vestigial thrashisms in Morbid Angel, right? Yeah. There, there's like more, th- there's, Angel Corpse has some of the things that can be a little just tiresome about Black Thrash to it. Um, th- this, Samoth doesn't have that at all. It's all the coolest parts of thrash metal being turned into a chassis for black metal and death metal riffing. Yeah, there's, there's a concerted effort to... There's a concerted effort to do what the Norse core bands were trying to do in the late 90s and 2000s, which is like to jettison the vestiges of like trad metal and do something purely created from within the genetic pool of extreme metal. That's a good way of describing it. Um, but a lot of those bands would never play a thrash beat. And I just love that there's some Deca Deca on this record. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it kind of takes the place of, you know, the, the war metal half blast, you know, the Archco blast. Hmm. Good point. All right. So I think we're doing both of our sample. Like, so I'm going to do my sample next too. Sure. Uh, and um, be, we're just going through the record in order, I guess. Uh, and here's a place where we get into on the next track, murderous artillery. I, I wanted, pla- I wanted to sample this one. This is such a cool song. <laughs> I, yeah. There were so many I wanted to sample. I mean, uh, this is, this is when I heard this track, it blew my mind. 
<laughs> right? Because I already really liked, like, I, I don't say that lightly, right? I really liked the first track. I was like, ha ha, this record is sick. <laughs> and then I, I heard this and it was just astonishing. So I, I'm not, I don't even want to really give this away. This could be a throwaway gesture, but it's executed to the hilt and it becomes an integral part of the music. I know exactly what you're talking about and I love it too. <laughs> Everything, would, everything you thought was cool at 12 years old is what's actually cool. Explosions, people dying, sick riffs, blast beats, all of it. Machine guns. <laughs> machine guns. <laughs> Huge uh, tits. <laughs> yeah. Machine gun tits. Um, <laughs> it's so good, dude. Uh, this is... um. This is just astonishingly cool. Everyone has fucked with those samples since the very beginning of the genre, right? Okay, let's put some, like, gunfire samples on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's add an air raid siren or a Stuka dive bomber or something, right? That's really sick. Um, And then the song starts. He just wrote the song around that and let the drummer go ham. It's... Again, you can hear that that fundamental principle for the drummer on this record. Just like I am not slowing down. Yeah, uh, and it's also it, it, there's there's such an admirable purity to the conceit. It's, Jan's like, hey, the song's called Murderous Artillery. Oh, what, what part of the band sounds? I need a part <laughs> that sounds a lot like guns and explosions. What sounds the most like that? I uh, probably probably drums, Jan. Okay, so just drum a lot for like a <laughs> minute. And then we'll just fucking go. I mean, you know, it's a good example. You know, I've talked before about wanting to hear more structural openness and improvisation in Mm -hmm. black metal. Oh, yeah. The last place I thought I'd hear it is on a war metal record of suffocating density. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We'll get into that. There's there's a lot of this record that sounds like just totally jammed out or even semi-improv at times. No, you're you're right. Yeah, I I think that's... Yeah, which makes it amazing. But this part in particular is like... It's just literally like he wrote in parentheses, drum solo. Uh, (laughs) It's like, it's John Bonham's evil twin. Um, uh, So you get just this, um, yeah, and and what's happening here is industrial collage, right? We get the juxtaposition of just berserk drumming, berserk noise drumming with uh, hideous war samples, it sounds like this guy is listening to Antichrist Kramer stuff or to Kolkata Inner Order or all of mm-hmm. the above, right? Yeah, there yeah. Is, he has completely kept up with innovations in war metal technology. Uh, and really, I mean, a lot of that kind of, a lot of the way, the, the some of the 
Kramer type stuff, right, is just like haywire drum machine and noise. Mm-hmm. And it's it's often like a cool concept that's a little unsatisfying because you kind of wish it was on some level a you know, a cool black death metal song. This this is a much this is like a fuller realization of the idea. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a great articulation of this like simple primordial extreme metal impulse. Um, yeah. it, it, it's just like. And yeah, how long is it? That's the first drum solo we've ever had on a record. It's like, why are we not doing that all the time? (laughs) That's true. That is the first drum solo ever on Terminus. Um, (laughs) And also, I want to talk about the way they get out of it, which relates to what you were saying about the improv or very shoot from the hip composition. They get out of it by returning to the first riff and they play one iteration or maybe three quarters of it. And then just switch riff um Mm -hmm. and at that point it's just such a simple primordial rhythm riff three notes you could just sing christ raping black metal over it right yeah (laughs) but but over top of it you have these um you know these uh pulsing uh pulsing sort of search light through the fog this more like you know the martial uh, yeah, this Marshall fanfare over it, and um, really cool, man. Yeah, that's uh, that is fucking awesome. And uh, I, I decided when that was playing, every metal band from now on has to have a part like that. Every you have to have a bunch of gunfire and a sick fucking drum solo. That's that's what we need now. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll get into my samples. Uh, for mine, I want to kind of highlight the death and grind pedigree behind this. Mm-hmm. Um. So we're going to go to the very next song. Uh, This whole album is a banger, but this, like, first half run of tracks is just, like, perfect. Um, Last Gasp of the Dying. Um, This is really interesting. Um, So Samoth riffs don't really transition into each other in, like, a meaningful way. Or (laughs) they transition into each other with an insanely tortured fill sequence that makes it even weirder and harder to understand. Um, But that's because Samoth isn't really, is again, like the Passiasm record we just talked about, it's got a ton of cool riffs, but it's not really a riffs band. Um, A lot of the riffing on this is either purely atonal or it's based off of, you know, basically stock second wave figures. But that's fine because like, one, they're really good articulations of it. And two, the point of this is to do a sort of like, brutal death metal musical athleticism. Uh, It is to see how extreme something can be made within the confines of this sort of established style. And I gotta say, (laughs) if we're talking about extremity arms race in this particular style of black metal, I think this has pretty much got it on lock. So let's listen to Last Gasp of the Dying. It's a, a real charming one.
I just figured something out about like why Jan and company make these more like stock riff formations sound good. It's because they remembered that they were originally done as like two single string lines, not just voicing it into like big blocky chords. Now I love big blocky chords, but when you do it like that, it like softens the whole thing. You know, it Mm -hmm. sort of turns it into a drone. It lacks that incisive quality of playing it on single strings. Mm -hmm. And actually a ton of the riffing, you know, the stuff that isn't just like atonal sliding power chords is pretty sophisticated dual guitar interaction just used to recreate a, a kind of riffing that you don't really hear in black metal anymore. Well, very often it's, I mean, I think in a lot of those riffs or at the, in the more melodic turn at the end of the last one I sampled there, um, are you saying that there, there are two leads going above the rhythm pattern? Well, no, just that the rhythm pattern and the, and the lead, the lead yes. are both d- done with single notes, which is a, yes. more of a death metal technique, too. Oh, really? I, I think I, I thought I heard chording in those, but you'd I, probably I think, know better than me. I think on that last big one, those were single string lines, but it's a little bit cloudy. I, I mean, can't really your, tell. Your point still stands, which is that... Uh, Twin guitar interplay was central to all of the more lofty Norwegian bands, and certainly to the Swedish bands. Uh, yeah, and and it's um it's the th- and you know it took quite a while until uh, the Finns and the French figured out how to produce somewhat similar effects with just one guy, right? Well, yeah, and 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 it's you can never actually match it. Yeah, and like you like you kind of gestured at. Um, when talking about, you know, weird similarities to, like, early Emperor, Jan mm-hmm. is clearly a guy who's been doing this so long and has such a different relationship with this music that he picks different things out of the same classic records that we like. You know, he's seizing on stuff that is viciously heavy. You know, he he's seizing on stuff that is, like, really atonal in early black metal. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, it's sort of like the difference between you and me when we listen to black metal, where you go to black metal for heaviness and aggression. And I think he's of a similar mindset. He sees it as fundamentally extreme music and that that fulfilling that is sort of paramount to having a black metal band. Yeah. Yeah. I, that totally makes sense. That, I, that makes a lot of sense. I think he hears early emperor in the way I do, but you know, also uh, due to a death metal guy point, right? It's like hearing, especially the early early Norse stuff that way means hearing the death metal in it. Um, yeah. You know, a, a lot of the nastiest parts on the Emperor EP have, like, just straight-up death metalism in it. Like, the pitch-shifted growls. Or yeah, um, I, I think that, and I think that's maybe why Jan's work uh, appeals so much to a lot of the DMU guys from their standpoint that, you know, black metal is an attempted successor genre to <laughs> death metal rather than a contemporary. It's an extension of the idea. Yes, that must be why they like this. But yeah, so on that last riff, right, or one of those last riffs, what you guys couldn't hear toward the end of the sample was the death metal guy yelling, fuck it, next riff, every time they train. <laughs> it's, it's, just... it, it, it's like each riff just like strong, like just open hand, just strong arms the last riff out of the way. Um, yeah, in a really um, weird sequence that keeps sort of like... Um... You know, as I like to say, shepherd's toning it, ratcheting up the tension with every single new fill that's introduced. Mm-hmm. It's like it's a really difficult, weird way to move between those riffs. <laughs> They're all melodically connected to each other. They just don't bother explaining those connections. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, th- there's there's no threading it together, but the um. The the main the lo- riff they're going on for the longest uh do 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 something like that right mm-hmm. is the ascending line that might give a modern listener the sort of um distant military music kick they get when listening to Vothana or mm-hmm. all the shit that's influenced by that but it's just an emperor riff that's being harmonized in a way that brings out the more um that brings out the most, uh, you know, uh, consonant side of it, and at the same time um, is being set against just a grinding, crushing rhythm riff. And yeah, that, like, it's all... His understanding of Emperor is shaped by Ison Samoth interplay. Yeah, and uh, yeah. obviously another connection that we have to build here that I think you mentioned in the notes, but I don't think you mentioned... Mm-hmm. while speaking is uh 
the the band that is the intersection of all these ideas of like ruthless extremity yes. while still a detailed melodic sense from Sweden, clearly influenced by both black and death metal and doing a sort of approximation of what would be called war metal, which is Needin Division 187. Um, which this record sounds more like Needin, despite being melodically very different than almost anything I've heard. Yeah, this is the most Needin-y record that isn't Needin that I've heard. And we the Cake record really had a lot of that to it, but it was, like, slowed down to a quarter speed and, you know, simplified to, like, an eighth of the notes and stuff. Yeah, uh, you can really hear it with those, like, keening downcast lead lines that are all over mm-hmm. this record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the, 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 the sort of moments of... Um, moments of almost poignant emotion that are happening in the middle of the bombardment. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's and, it's really awesome. Yeah, so um yeah, let's forward. Okay, forward. <laughs> A song called Decimated tucked away at the end of the record. <laughs> uh there is no fucking understandable structure on this song. Uh this is but this is where I want to talk about it's like this is Okay, what what if Norse Core was what it said on the title? What if you were a black metal guy that took grindcore really, really seriously and made that a foundational part of the mechanics of your black metal band? You get a song like Decimated. Oh, dude, it's what the fuck is happening? The way they keep playing, the way they keep playing with the length of that snare fill and they keep extending it longer and longer. So it feels like you're going into a new time signature, but you're not Um, the the total, the insane opening riff that just sounds like something off one of the micro tracks from the first couple Napalm Death records. Um, I mean, given Jan's age, it's entirely possible that, you know, he has the Siege demo tucked away in his his sock drawer. Mm -hmm. And it it totally makes sense listening to this. This is like what happens when you apply sort of early spazzy grindcore technique to black metal while not turning it into, you know, cool guy art music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, This sounds more like Righteous Pigs or like Hideous Manglias or any of those really Mm. gorked kind of early death grind thrash bands. Um, It's such a cool thing to hear on this record. And it's, it's, as soon as I landed on this song, I was like, uh, what's going to be my other sample? Uh, Oh, the one that's completely indecipherable. I fucking love it. Yeah. Dude, the, um, I I just want to say the, uh, 
the thing it goes into, though, is just... So, like, there are these riffs that sound like they were composed by improvising. The second riff, though, has, like... The weird thing is that they have... Some of them have stable forms. Like, he remembers them, even though they're these, like, hideously mangled uh, sort of, you know, um, things. But the... Um, on the second half, he plays this this riff that's like twenty power chords long, and <laughs> runs it through so many different chord changes that it has the kind of just uh, it has the kind of inhuman glory of the most just uh, stark modernist classical music, or the you know the the most modern sounding late 19th century stuff it's i don't really know what the reference points would be but like although this song is just completely just all over the place grinding energy it just lights into this riff that has all the same dissonance but also major things sort of uh powerful lifting dorian tones it just it it um it's yeah, I don't know. You like you get to hear the compositional chops throughout that, and then underneath it, pitch shifted growl. <laughs> it's it's literally everything we want in extreme metal in one place. Right, guys we are back with uh, a, a a third time repeating artist uh here on terminus uh this is actually going to be the fourth full length that we've covered by them because they just release too much fucking music <laughs> and uh for those interested uh that is of course reverorum ib malacht uh with the record uh, vacuum the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again for la telse och levitation. Uh, and that is released uh, 
I, I guess I, I thought it was independently through Malak Media, but apparently no. Both the digital and the vinyl releases are released by Rubius Obex, of course. Um, Reverorum Ib Malak is a record. Uh, excuse me, is a record. Uh, is a band that we've covered a lot on this show. They're a personal favorite of mine. Uh, for those who haven't heard our reviews of prior records, um, Reverorum is a kind of industrial black metal band uh, with a lot of noise and a lot of detailed electronic work, um, oftentimes crossing more into pure industrial or ambient music than black metal, but spiritually all sort of connected musically. Um, Vacuum is a record that was actually initially released back in 2022, but just got its first vinyl release this year. Uh, I decided to cover it. There was, there was a lot of back and forth with me and my co-host as to which of the billion Reverorum records we were covering. <laughs> so, so you yes. got a sneak peek at Kyrie El- Elison, which we'll probably end up covering on the show. Kyrie. Uh, oh, is it Kyrie? Ky- okay. Ky- Kyrie Elison, is a, I think, is a model. <laughs> uh, I think she was an Australian pop star. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we're, but this time we're going to be covering Vacuum, uh, which is Vacuum came out as kind of a surprise release last year, uh, coming off of the heels of 2021's kind of two part double album, uh, Svagi Doden and Not Here. Uh, Vacuum is. A full length, but a full length doesn't really tell you a whole lot when it comes to Reverorum Ib Malakt. Um, a full length can be a sort of standard album, and then sometimes it can be kind of an experimental diversion. And Vacuum is one of those. It's not meant to be listened to in the same way as some of their, you know, I, I don't want to use the word substantial works, but, you know, for lack of a better phrase. Um this is deliberately weird and alienating, even for Reverum Ibalak's mm. typically very weird and alienating presentation. And I think that it is pretty cool and interesting. And I think it's cooler and more interesting the more into this band you are and into some of the uh, some of the meta conversations we've had on the show uh, regarding this band and how they how they like to approach art in general. Uh, it's a it's a very it's a very self referential record, I guess I would say, and it's like it, it rewards being a close fan of this band in general. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what are your initial impressions? Well, now, now that you've heard like five Malax records. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, th- this guy uh, accidentally listened to Kyrie Eliason because I thought that's the record you were talking about. Um, <laughs> Sorry, and man, I boy, clarified. <laughs> that one is really good, and I'm sure we will review it this year because it's definitely a relevant this year release. Uh, yeah, no, that one's awesome, man. I listened to it in a really the biggest thunderstorm that's hit this summer and you could you mm-hmm. know you could hear the uh you could hear the lamentations yeah, um, <laughs> yeah but but it was um <clears throat> uh yeah the, this record is uh, and i thought it sounded to me like in a way maybe it's their most concerted complete statement yet uh it's it's the, that's a cool record um this, this is definitely more eccentric and yeah, I think it's more for the hardcore fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the uh, when uh, maybe I got blue balled a little because I think you told me it was going to sound like the Berserker, and so I put on <laughs> my, I put on my mouth guard and my football helmet. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but um, it, it it's more like. This is far to the non-metal side of industrial. There's a lot yes. of parts that really sound like industrial metal, for sure, or that just are. But the way it's structured is far over on non-metal industrial. Mm-hmm. If it reminded me of one record, I would say it reminds me of Too Dark Park, a, a a brilliant record that nobody actually wants to listen to. That's um, that's also probably my favorite Skinny Puppy album, <laughs> which is exactly, funny. <laughs> no, it's, it's really good. I've listened to it exactly once. It was awesome. I'm never inclined to listen to it again, but like it's really <laughs> it's really cool. Like yeah. uh, um, it's it's a it's a consuming experience that is sort of um, you know, it, it's a consuming experience. It is difficult. It 
is scary. It's all those things, right? Uh, mm-hmm. This record is like a more kind of meandering, uh, experimental version of something like that. Uh, and it's... Um, and, and it's something that because of this uh, deliberately difficult nature... And because it explores all these different niches in the Reverorum sound, I think is what you were getting at. Uh, uh-huh. it, it really is geared towards hardcore fans. Um, if there's a thing that I like don't, don't really like about it, it would be the way that this takes the industrial cut-up approach so far. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Each new part kind of hits in a way that either negates the last thing or sort of diverts us from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're doing that on purpose. It's not an accidental thing. But what it does is it distances you from, um, it pulls you back from the immediacy of the music, and it makes it kind of cerebral. So, like, you're, in, instead of being, um, instead of being taken up in the, in, in the riffs and the action, right, uh, you're thinking of it more as a logical structure. Like, how do these different parts relate to each other? Uh, it's, it's setting you a puzzle. Right? Yeah, I, and that's I, a legitimate I fully agree. kind of. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not pulling that out of my ass. It's, no, no. It, it's a legitimate kind of art, right? And there's, you know, there's. Uh, it's not my favorite kind of art, but it's 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 you know it's advanced. It's very sophisticated art. Uh, each part has a feeling, but you're really trying to figure out this sort of conversation that's being created through the way. Really, each each section with its distinct feeling comments on the last one, uh, and you know, um, you could say instead of just building on it or uh, responding to it in a more immediate way, if that makes sense, it comments mm-hmm. on it. So this is kind of like rhetorical music, um, and that's reflected in another level, which is that here, I mean, Reverorum obviously are kind of a liturgical band. They're always interested in the setting of text to music because it's, you know, Catholic religious music. Mm -hmm. But here especially, there's a lot of weight on the lyrics, which primarily are samples. Mm -hmm. Um, They are used in a really skillful, cool way. Um, They succeed in making the samples sound cool. But it means that the record really is more rhetorical than specifically musical. Uh, and it's, it's, they sample a lot of what sounds like, if they're not, maybe they're Catholics, they might be evangelicals. I believe they're evangelicals. Yeah, they sample a lot of evangelical, televangelist stuff from the 80s and early 90s, like culture war period, or I guess the, the, the last phase of it. Um, mm-hmm. And they, um, and in so doing, they're inverting a trope of 80s or 90s industrial, right? Which is the creepy sample of the, uh, you know, the, the creepy sample of the evangelist. Yeah, the, um, the fire and brimstone sermon. Right. Yeah. And those samples are supposed to make them sound simultaneously kind of like menacing and ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in those older bands, right? Mm-hmm. Here, they take those samples and they make them sound really cool and set them up with the music. (laughs) And that's an authentically black metal thing, right? We've talked about this before. Black metal is about taking scary things that other people find scary or that are conventionally associated with being scary. And you're like, no, you see, this is cool. This is what's cool. (laughs) (laughs) They're doing that here in a a pretty... uh, I get it, you know. Some of those some of those sermon lines hit pretty hard. Uh, um, so, like, I think there's a lot of skillful stuff going on in here. Um, that said, I think a lot of thoughts on this record, but I'm just reading off what I wrote, and then I'm going to turn the rest of the thing over to you. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I, there's some stuff I can get to later. Let's let's roll. Yeah. So, uh, I guess uh, musically, the biggest thing to mention here is that. I would say half to two thirds of the the metal material on this record is really oriented around death metal rather than black metal, and mm-hmm. I'm talking about like there's there's fucking slam riffs on this yeah, album. Yeah, yeah. There's brutal death stuff that happens. Um, the opening of the first track is a a ferocious sort of cut up death grind thing that reminds me of uh, some of Intestinal Disgorge's later albums. Um, and it's weird to say, but it's like, 
I think that's deliberate. I think that Reverorm Ibmalak probably listened to stuff like Intestinal Discord and just the weirdest fringe edges of experimentalism in any given genre of metal. Because um, I think that's where their heart really lies, yeah, yeah, is yeah. a sort of like experimental academic music approach to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly agree with what you mean, that this is rhetorical music. This is music that is about a discussion rather than the experience of listening to the album. And as a result, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd also agree with you that just by definition, that's going to make it slightly inferior to um, other work that these guys do, which can be so all-encompassing and a really unique experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's one of those cases where it's not the sort of thing I typically like, but I like that it's there for this band. Um, I think I think yeah, they're yeah. Uh, they're a band with a discography long and complicated enough that you know having a a weird sort of symposium on itself kind of works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so definitely a lot of this has to do with commentary on the band itself, and if we're gonna turn more theologically, it's really centered around a few uh, a few operating principles, um, more specific than Reverorum typically is, I feel. Uh, And those things are uh, the nature of Christ, uh, the physical resurrection of Christ, Mm -hmm. and how the physical resurrection is a a, a necessary foundational part of the legitimacy of Christianity itself. Um, A very interesting thing is happening in these samples where Reverorum on this record is all about reaffirming the supernatural and, as mm-hmm. some would call it, pagan core of the Catholic Church. You know, th- uh, the album concludes, uh, one version of the album, this is the album and then played with a, it says remix, but it's not just remix. There's massive, like, arrangement differences and layers that are changed and samples that are different. Um But the album basically concludes with one of these evangelical preachers talking about how without the resurrection of Christ, Mm -hmm. without the empty tomb, Christianity is a farce. So I think that in part, Reverorum... And and that sample comes in the middle of the record, too. So are you saying the record kind of resurrects itself or something? Yeah, it sort of... um, It loops in on itself in a weird Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so, so basically what Rever Orem are saying is, again, they are reaffirming the, the supernatural foundation of Christianity, uh, sort of as a response to modern Christianity's tendency to work itself into a sort of secular humanism. They're saying, mm-hmm. fuck that. No, the, the supernatural resurrection of Christ is central and fundamental to this religion, and without it, we have nothing, which is a really interesting thing to make a black metal record about, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which brings it closer to the sort of like pagan animism that underpins a lot of uh, Catholic ritual. Um, and the other like thing... That. The other thing they're doing that they're playing with, because I know that you're going to want to talk about this... Um, Maybe I should save this point. But regarding the the evangelical samples and the sort of like morbid, scary tone of the mm-hmm. record, I think there's an internal logic to it. But mm-hmm. I think we can get to that when we get to it. Because um, I, I, I've got points about that that I really thought of, like myself while listening to it. I had already thought it's like, oh, man, this is like ostentatiously spooky for Reverorum. Mm-hmm. And then I was like thinking it through, and I think I've got an interesting perspective on it. Um, so... But let's listen to a sample where we can talk about sort of the meat of what a lot of this record is made of, which is involved, very deliberately weird tech death stuff from around the mid 90s, but executed within these established idioms of Reverorum Ibmalacht, where they're intersecting with these huge walls of blast beats with with murky, dark ambient passages. Um, These songs, these two songs reflecting themselves, making four are really about um, they're, they're, they they sound like micro songs or individual sketches of ideas that have been cut up and arranged in a pleasing manner. Uh, so any two minute snatch of this record sounds completely different from any other two minute snatch. But I'm gonna go to one a ten so we can listen to a passage where you get a, a solid idea of what the death metal material on this album sounds like.
He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am in eternal existence. No wonder they got angry. No wonder they threw stones at him. No wonder they tried to kill him. And no wonder they eventually did crucify him. He stood and said, I am. So something pretty interesting happens in that section, uh, you know, getting back to that idea of everything being structural commentary. So we start with that that really weird, simmering mid-90s tech death crawl up front. Uh, then that same riff is deployed over what I would call like one of Reverorum's most distinct parts that they use a lot, which are these inhumanly fl- fast uh double kick or blast sections with these Mm -hmm. looming, enormously big uh, synth chords kind of hanging over them. Um, But then, uh, you know, we get uh, we get the same riff played over that inhumanly fast double kick, but without the synths, which sort of recontextualizes it. And it sounds very natural, like you could be doing uh, a sort of technical late 90s death metal within that idiom. Um, there's a lot that Reverend is doing about playing with the context and, you know, the origin of certain ideas on this record. Then we have the sample where we were talking about, you know, you know, you know, the execution of Christ because he said, I am God, you know, he proclaimed himself, uh, and what follows that is not another grandiose Reverend passage, but a really nasty, like 16th note palm muted brutal death riff, like something you'd hear from mm-hmm. exterminated or something. Which is bizarre. You know, the, the the conventional logic there would be to put one of those enormous reverorum moments after it, you know, sort of enhance that liturgical power. But that's not what's being done. Here, we're trying to draw attention to the underpinning of a- aggression and sort, sort of violence in the act of proclaiming oneself God. Mm-hmm. Which is really interesting. You know, Reverum is always about digging out these sort of like, not evil parts of Christianity, but like the mi- most misunderstood, the most violent and the most sort of, you know, single minded parts of it. And I think that's a really effective way to do it. Uh, also, all the tech death stuff on this record sounds really fucking cool. And they should just do a side project that's a death metal band. And I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that part is really sick. I mean... Also, in terms of sort of uh, their kind of counter heresy within Orthodox black metal, right? Arguably, they've never left Orthodox black metal because, Mm -hmm. you know, Orthodox black metal has a pretty strongly Catholic subtext to begin with, right? And these guys figured it out. Yeah. Um, But, um, yeah, somebody in the comments was saying, like, they should do a split with DSO and someone, and I think writes, and I think somebody commented that it was unlikely given their religious views. (laughs) <laughs> but, like, these guys would totally do a split with DSO. DSO would totally do a split with these guys. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do a split with a new DSO, but, you know. Um, uh, anyway, um, digression. Basically, like, there's this sort of, right, obviously there's this counter-heretical defection to Catholicism happening. Um, and you've pointed out before on, you know, their 2020 record how they were, uh, you know, playing with, sometimes playing with inverting recontextualizing sometimes mocking a black metal convention mm-hmm. um sometimes really lovably embrace lovingly embracing it uh but like on this record the embrace of these kinds of death metal 
is like I think mega heresy for Orthodox BM. Right? <laughs> uh, there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, death metal in Orthodox stuff. That's something we've both noticed more over the years. But it's specifically sort of immolation. Um, and this is the most sort of jagged, autistic, tech, whatever stuff from the same time as the Orthodox stuff arose. Uh, and it's just being thrown into this, uh, thrown into the grinder. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I mean, the, the commentary the, of... The... Sorry, ahead. I figured out one better way to say it. These are death metal riffs that would offend most black metal guys, right? If, if yeah, I yeah. were younger, I would be offended. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's actually a really good point. There is, um, Reverum loves playing with the contours of black metal. Like, for instance, on the the second track, you know, the uh, the uh, was it the B tracks or the mm-hmm. yeah, so one one a ten one b yeah the B tracks. Um, there tends to be a uh, or a, God, it's so weird to talk about these. The things. track titles are bizarre. Just call them one, two, three, four. Yeah. So on the uh, the second track that you hear two versions of, it starts with one of those clearly parodic black metal riffs. That da 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 da. Oh yeah, it's like the shitty the shitty Dark Throne riff. Yeah, yeah, and that's like <laughs> it's completely deliberate. And then there's yeah. a counterpoint riff that's actually kind of sophisticated in a Gorgoroth way, but then mm-hmm. it just snaps back and then it just the whole thing kind of peters out into like yeah. murky dark ambience and then weird shit starts happening from yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> no, they they just casually write like 3 minutes of a bad black metal song and they're like, "Anyway, moving on." <laughs> yeah, I love, I love, I love the the bizarre artistic instincts of this band. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, yeah, about the death metal. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds really good. Um, I the the sort of text setting there. That's a very good example of it being effective. Um, uh, you know, yeah, the sermon is you know the guy may, when, when the guy says it that way, you get his point, right? Um, yeah, exactly. But they were um. <laughs> Yeah, you 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 can see why. Uh, but um, they uh. So really, I mean, I guess I sort of said it at the beginning. I, I got into interpret, got into trying to give my take on the record. But it's a long way of saying this is a very cool record for fans and for people who are also for people who are maybe more inter- invested in the Catholic side of black metal or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right? For me, I find most of the album pretty dull. Um, yeah, I got you. Yeah, uh, that's uh, yeah. No, you knew that. I was doing it more for the audience. It's like uh, on a compositional level. That said, there are some parts that are really cool. I mean, the part you just sampled was cool. Here's just a part where that I found was really engaging, and it's not just like they lock into a sick riff and play it for four minutes. Um, they sort of do that, but. This is a record that sort of eschews focused repetition, right? And it also eschews gradual development of these things that are like the main principles of black metal songwriting. Um, and here's a passage that does both at once, but it does it with death metal riffs and with incredible labyrinthine complexity. Uh, and it really reminds me of a band that is uh, sort of, um, I don't know, like... Um, uh, dodecahedrally related to our hearts, which is uh, the cube. <laughs>
bet you weren't expecting that. <laughs> so how cool is that? Just, uh, like, I, I, I was going to do two samples for this record, but I said I wrote in the notes that I regretted not being able to sample the four, full four minutes of that, so then I just sampled the full four minutes of that, and that's my samples. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a crazy the, developmental section. It's insane. And so it's a it's a thing, it's a section that is intensely gratifying in itself. Every new chug is cool. Every transition is both hilarious and <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and it, it just is the cool part. But then it turns out that those in sort of uh gradually escalating high tension uh paranoid melodies are rhythmic phrases chugs uh that those paranoid chugs are actually a build-up mm -hmm. and you get like it switches to six eight which might give you a little cue of what's coming and then you get just like a completely conventional extremely heavy 90s black metal drop <laughs> and you get just like you know obviously the way they do the the keys and the vocals it's all much more spectral it's all like the ghost of black metal or something mm -hmm. but like it's it, 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 it's a very immediate black metal -y part. But yeah, that, that whole part, you could hear the separation connection kind of, right? Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's like very mid-tempo and industrial-rooted, and in some sense very gut-level gut ignorant, but there's tons of bizarre textural and lead stuff going on and rhythmic interplay, and it sounds totally futuristic and weird. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you listen to this passage how much you forget about the context around it. Like, I think that's why Ooh. it's so long is like, so you'll kind of forget that it's Reverora Mibmalocked. Or I also thought yeah. that I was also thinking that like something that's happening on a lot of these is like they're using these kind of like spooky liturgical samples. But then they're again, they're changing the context and they're sort of asking the question. It's like th this sort of religious significance, if it works just as well over, like, the mid-90s tech death riff, is it actually attached to black metal? You know, it's it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's But yeah, it's also well, just a really cool showcase of just excellent old-school tech death riffs. Uh, it, it's interesting, yeah, because the rest of the record is about, like, think of the context, and this mm -hmm. whole passage is like, forget it. I think that's very smart. Um, so there's something going on here. Uh, but more than that... Um, you want to run through the structure this also has that kind of uh resurrecting or doubling structure mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure they go through they do exact they do one thing then they do it exactly the same but different every time mm -hmm. uh it's just one very long sequence they repeat that sequence with variations then it goes off the rails and then you get the six eight and then the drop Right, mm -hmm. uh, it goes off the rest of that that little kind of like Grammy <laughs> bar solo, right? Um, but so, tell, tell me if I'm missing anything. I tried to map it out. Mm -hmm. Part one: super ignorant slam riff. Yeah, we that's like that. that's like a fucking reputilation riff or something. It's, it's sort of like like it's almost like baby's first slam, but in a good way. Yeah, right? it's like um, number two: heavily subdivided, down tempo, brutal death, sixteenth chugs. Yeah, right right um and except it's like the most element it reminds you it's a thrash riff it's the most basic thrash metal figure it's like the master of puppets riff mm -hmm. right and it kind of mutates as it goes on so it sort of it has a very predictable form at first and then like it just uh starts iterating in weird ways um uh, and and then it goes. You get the. Doo -doo 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 I think it goes up a fourth or something. Yeah. It does something like the thrash metal root note chord change, and you get something that sounds more like a really basic Slayer riff, mm -hmm. but in this chuggy context. Then we get uh, this more, uh, much more text, much more layered, uh, harmonically dense passage, which is like the. Thelahungenji riff, um, you know the King Crimson riff, um, and then it all loops again. Uh, that's just really, really cool. Uh, and they certainly could just have a death metal band if they wanted. Yeah, it's. Well, I mean, it's it's also you know, 
nobody's really sure who all the people in Reverorm Ibmalacht are, so it's like, mm-hmm. maybe they got those riffs from one of the death metal guys who's happened to find himself in this, like, Catholic black metal commune or whatever. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. So, I'm gonna slide over to uh, our last sample, which is off of the uh, the B labeled tracks, the alternate mix. Uh, and I'm gonna be picking up right around where the black metal guy left off. And I wanted to touch on the idea of uh, Malak trying to be scary here, uh, especially with the with the samples that they're using and using them, like as you said, in this almost '90s industrial way. Well, I think there's one thing we got to keep in mind is Reverer Ib Malak is a really funny band, which is like weird to say, but it's like their stuff is always dotted with these sort of like intricate musical jokes that you only appreciate if you've listened to a ton of black metal. Um, and I think what's happening there is they're playing with the juxtaposition of, on one hand, um, they are doing exactly what you said, which is, what if the scary thing was actually the cool thing? That's definitely a part of it. But they're also playing with the the, the tropes and expectations of the genre of music that they find themselves in. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're they just keep raising these questions of context, which is like, okay, so we're doing exactly this. How does the context change when you know the, the like theological background of the band? And also there's a game they're playing where it's like, they know how those things are perceived by their audience. Mm-hmm. You know, anyone who's uh, come up in extreme music has heard stuff to that effect um, dozens of times before. And we are primed to experience it in a certain way. Um, and they're, again, playing with the context and the priming there. Uh, so I, I think it's just a... It means exactly what it means on the tin, but it's also playing with the expectations of the extreme music audience that they themselves are a part of. Um, and I, I don't know. I really like that. Maybe, maybe that's like almost overly high-minded, but I, I think it's a really too, cool thing. Too postmodern for this guy. I <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's fair. I've got more time for that kind of shit than you do. Mm-hmm. But, um... Let's go to uh, picking up basically where you left off, but with the alternate mix. Uh, And this is what I think is kind of the climax of the record, is this final concluding passage. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, the, the primary theological idea on this album.
Oh, I'm gonna, I'm I'm running it to like eighteen thirty five to get to the end of the sample. Oh, oh no, no, I I, I stopped it. I just couldn't hear what you said. I, I got to eighteen thirty nine. Okay, okay, cool. Go, go in whenever you want. <clears throat> So here at the the end or the midpoint of the album, depending on how you perceive it, uh, the the statement is made. That sample, I think, is the spiritual core of the record. Um, and I think what's happening here is complicated, and it's asking multiple similar questions at the same time. One, which I think is interesting, is this is Reverorum at sort of their most accusatory of other Christians. Um, you know, specifically calling out, you know, those who have forgotten the gospel and forgotten the physical manifestation of the divinity of Christ. And they say, mm-hmm. they say, that is not you. The, you, you, you are not a Christian without that. This religion has absolutely no meaning. It is predicated upon this true miracle occurring. Um, resurrection and the body and spirit right? yes exactly you know a lot of a lot of nowadays christians a lot of like non-denominational protestant sects are always talking about oh, you know it's an interpretive thing it's a you know it's a, a philosophical statement it's not we're talking about the fucking bodily resurrection of christ yeah. christ, um, christ is christ is man creating himself right through his own suffering and you know yeah yeah exactly um, um Oh, sorry. Can I, can, can I inject one thing there real quick? Yeah, sure. It's significant in that context that they're using uh, fire and brimstone evangelicals, because if the thing they're criticizing is, broadly speaking, a Protestant secularizing tendency, right? Although it's mm. in some modern, it's in a lot of modern Catholicism, too. Any sort of insufficiently traditional yes. Christianity, yeah. Yes, if, if they're criticizing this sort of... Um, uh, secular Protestant tradition, it's significant that they're using evangelicals to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, and I think part of it is, part of it you got to remember is Reverend just being pragmatic. It's like, oh, these guys sound fucking cool when they say yeah, this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's like the main question. That's the the question for sort of their Christian audience. But they're always speaking to two audiences. They're speaking to a Christian audience and a black metal audience. And then what I think is being said to the black metal audience is, it's a sort of affectionate challenge to state where their spiritual core is in equally unwavering terms because they've Mm -hmm. played this whole album playing with the context of these things that we immediately associate with black metal in a sense saying well it's it's not here you know the spiritual core can't be in any of these aesthetic gestures so the end of the record kind of plants their flag and says this is our spiritual and ideological core what is yours and I think that's a really fascinating and ambitious and daring question to ask. This is Josh from Defeated Sanity, and you're listening to Terminus Extreme Metal Podcast. And we are back for one last round with the somewhat surprising return of Kaivum with Culture. This is uh, this was hailed by the um, EP Federlandet's Altair, which I guess came out in 2021. Yeah, really late 2021. It feels like it just came out, but it came out at the end of two years ago. Uh, and that was the first we'd heard from them in a long time. Um, <clears throat> uh, for some of you youngsters out there, this may not be uh, a familiar name. Kaivum is a band that, like, I guess maybe they were one of the first bands heralding black metal getting good again. <laughs> do, do you, like, right around, um, yeah, so their last record, Nature, or Nature, uh, came out in 2011. Uh, and it was sort of instantly a huge hit. Uh, it, not like a huge hit, obviously. It wasn't on the radio, but uh, it was it was popular. It it broke outside the. Um, ba- it might be hard for people to imagine these days when, like, I, I don't know, you know, uh, all the cool kids talk about, you know, absurd and Votana and you know, uh, Argosland all the time. But back in the day, uh, the NS scene was kind of a generic ghetto. Uh, there were very serious people who were really interested in and in- influenced by those sounds, obviously, and there were 
really good bands in that scene, but it was uh, um, a lot. Do you remember when a lot of black metal people just didn't take it particularly seriously, or were just like, "This is like too poppy." Oh yeah, well, uh, I I don't remember the days of too poppy. I feel like that's now with stuff like Eyes and. Well, no, no, the music definitely got way too poppy now. But I remember like people complaining about that music back in the day that it was too poppy. Maybe like early Goat Moon and stuff, but this was also mm-hmm. coming out of a two thousands period where ninety percent of NSBM was just like buzzsaw four track stuff with Hitler speeches on it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Just smack the Xerox of Hitler and the UFO. Exactly. Right, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes, it it was uh, generally pretty pretty janky. Um, but like, Kaivum was sort of imposed themselves on the black metal scene as a whole, in part by writing music that was not, uh, you know, in part by writing black metal albums. Yeah. Right. Rather than things that were tuned to the tuned to their own sort of uh, ideological and musical niche. Um, not sure was just an undeniable, formidable, barreling black metal album. Uh, and, um, what did it have that other things at the time didn't? It was, uh, minimalist, extremely raw, but not Dark Throne Worship, which a lot of things still sounded like back then that were raw, or Burzum. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was rooted basically in Ulver, weirdly, and in Gorgoroth, um, and it sounded extremely, uh, it sounded stately and vicious at the same time, uh, in the way that some some of the best moments on the 90s stuff did, but it was not necessarily distilled in this way until later. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I, that's not totally true, but, like, it sounded like all the, it, it had that combination, that simultaneity of the epic and the grotesque that the early 90s stuff had. And it was, um, uh, and they did it without drawing on the things that became the real cornerstones of more, uh, m- more sort of consonant, uh, majestic sounding stuff, right? Like, you know, that, the, the Franco Finnish style, as we call it, right? Yeah. This was not like Satanic Warmaster recording or Senor Voland riffs. It was very Norwegian sounding, and it activated a completely different side of the Norwegian tradition from the sort of, like, grinding, dissonant, spooky Satan music that, you know, uh, everyone emphasized at that time. Mm. So, so yeah, it, um, it, it also, uh, I guess another, we'll come back to this shortly, but the other big thing that happened then was that a Polish band called Migla was breaking. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into why that's relevant. Uh, with Heart Stories None as 2012, uh, Groza was getting really popular in the underground right then. Um, but yeah, so did you listen to Kaivum back in the day? I listened to Notcher like mm-hmm. years and years ago. I remember basically liking it, but I don't remember how it sounded. Like when it came out was a period where I was not really listening to a lot of black metal. So mm-hmm. I think I missed the big wave of it. So really, I only got exposed to it through talking to you because that's just like early 2010s black metal is a weird blind spot for me. Uh, in a yeah, lot we, of were, we were kind of out of touch for a year or two at that point, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is, um, I don't know, what's... I mean, I think we both think this is a great album, but what's what's your... You have a very interesting take on it. Or should we do a sample first? Do you want to do a big reveal? The the, the death metal guy has a hot take. <laughs> um, yeah, let's do, let's do a big reveal, uh, if, you're, uh, if your first sample's appropriate for it. I mean, either of mine are, so... Well, uh, why don't we go with one of yours, then? I think I think both of mine are a little... One of mine... Uh, okay. Actually, this is, this is the way we can sequence it. Let's do one of mine, and then one of yours, that's to your point. Um, okay. I'm going to do... My sample is, I think, one of the moments that's... Cl- my first sample, I'll give you something that's closest to the uh, classic Kaivum sound. Uh, um, you know, um, so this is... Uh, Varen Ogtid. <laughs>
So that captures the berserk, uh, and I mean that literally, aggression in the band. Nature was about just, I think, pretty clearly just the Viking way of life. It was about just living as a predator and taking what you wanted, right? And this is the only track on culture that follows that impulse through most of the song, if not all of it. However, the death metal guy has something to point out about how, uh, about that shift that happens in the middle there. Oh, well, um, well, I guess more broadly, this is, this is basically a DSBM record. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like three quarters of the material on this album, I would comfortably call DSBM. And it's also, it's referential to an older style of DSBM where it was like, Hey, DSBM could go fast sometimes, and it could have dissonance sometimes, you know? Um, it, and it could sound warlike, right? And a- a- aggressive. This yeah, is, exactly. Um, it was when it was is, still black metal. <laughs> right, right. And this is a style that we've highlighted a lot on the show, right? Like, we specifically, you t- you and I talk a lot about Nyctalgia. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but... a paradigm for that. Yeah, Nyctalgia, definitely a paradigm for that. Uh, honestly, what this sounds the closest to across most of the album is Total Self-Hatred, um, which are like a, a landmark DSBM band from like the latter era of that mm-hmm. genre's prominence, who I still love a lot. But it's like, dude, you should just listen to Total Self-Hatred. You'll be really into it. <laughs> there are places where some of the cording is also close to... I mean, we talked about it on the Austere record, right? The Austere record often sounds like Blazeberth Hall or something. Right? Oh, yeah, the, the and, opening riff on this sounded a lot like an Austere riff. Yes, yes. Yeah, so the Austere, at, at their mo- when Austere goes their most epic, they get close to this and vice versa. Um, and the, uh, the point where it doesn't... It'll get clearer on your sample, but the thing that's stylistically DSBM there is the abrupt slowdown, uh, the rhythms in the slowdown. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cording-wise, it's not necessarily a DSBM thing. That really reminds me of Treldom, who I'm sure these guys listen to. Uh, oh, yeah. It's these sort of droning major key moments in, tre- in Treldom. And he, the way he's going absolutely insane, um, on the one hand, it's DSBM vocalists, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, the self-mutilation stuff and just the drama yeah. of the performance. On the other hand, it's Gall in Treldom, who sounds just the most like a shaman any black metal vocalist has sounded. Uh, so this is their most sort of berserking track, and, and the cording throughout the beginning part is characteristic of them. <laughs> Very deliberately spaced, all the time in the world, uh sort of vast and cold yeah Um, no definitely i mean and you can you can sort of draw that line back thinking about you know the the originating dsbm band or as we've agreed to call it today strid you know mm -hmm. coming directly out of the second wave you know all the pieces were there at that time to make that music Or, although it sounds extremely different forgotten woods who are both very vikingy and very dsbm yeah definitely um so let me let, let me go directly into my sample because then I think that'll give some more context for how I think this functions as a DSBM record and we can sort of elaborate on that and this, the the network of musical connections at work here. So I want to go to Gold Mit Uns. This is probably my favorite track on the album. Um and I am going to, just as a preface, highlight the vocal performance, which is utterly fucking insane and basically the guiding voice on the album and easily one of the highlights of it.
So yeah, that that sample pretty much explains itself. Those are all just DSBM riffs, fundamentally. Um, and they're really fucking good DSBM riffs. Um, again, we're pulling on stuff like Total Self-Hatred and Thy Light, uh, as well as, you know, one of the huge stonker riffs in there is basically just a modified Senior Valand riff, but made even more crushingly sad than the saddest stuff that band put out. Um, back to the vocals. Uh, <laughs> I mean, me. also, the way those riffs, uh, when they pull out of the main riff and just sort of the way the band as a whole, including the drummer, accomplishes the transitions there is really cool. All the band, all the riffs sort of just like spill over into the next one in this really, uh, it, I don't know. It's like, yeah, spill over. It really is like, it feels easy. It feels like all of a sudden you're in the next riff effortless, but it preserves all of the momentum. And they do that without the guitarist using the vicious, uh, the vicious tone he used on the old stuff. Yeah. There's, there's definitely a concerted effort to make this a very smooth listening experience, mm-hmm. but in yeah. kind of a different way from a lot of black metal bands that are too smooth and rounded off because, uh, this album has some of the best, riffs that I've heard this year just full stop but it is not again a riffs album it's an album about a vocalist uh so you wrote something in the notes while we were listening because I talked about how much I enjoyed the vocals you said apparently people think it's a new vocalist and they don't like him yeah it's all over the comments it's um very puzzling cool uh hey you're all wrong these are what black metal vocals should sound like in many cases. Um, clearly, this guy is pulling from the Attila playbook of using the voice as a theatrical device. Mm-hmm. Um, he's singing in, you know, a ton of different styles, and then his direct black metal vocals are some of just the... There's more force behind it than in nearly anything I've oh, ever heard. Yeah, he 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 means it, man. Yeah, this is, this is bleeding from the throat shit. Mm-hmm. Um... The cleans are great. The bizarre sort of one-off stuff like that, that horrible gasping, Mm -hmm. spitting out a wad of phlegm part in this Mm -hmm. is awesome. And it it conveys the the same level of like miserable, cynical scorn that it should. Um, This is an album that is driven by the vocals. Um, They just pulled, he just matured immensely as a vocalist in the last like, uh, he was a great vocalist before, but it was much more just like piercing stellar sea eagle screech. Yeah. Um, and he gave it, you know, he's like, it's been 12 years. Mature did, I think they put out more stuff with Nordfried, but he's mm-hmm. just, his range has just really matured. And they changed the production completely to bring it forward. And why wouldn't they? Yeah, they, they know that they've got, like, a gem on their hands in his vocal performance. Mm-hmm. But the music is really designed to highlight that. Uh, the music is designed to be a sort of homogenous uh, bed of beautiful, morose riffing. And the vocalist basically conducts a guided tour through these desolate landscapes, operating as a sort of orator over the whole thing. The lyrics aren't available for this yet. I'm sure that they're very important to the overall context of the record, but it it seems to go without saying that, like, that is the driving force on this album, which is weird because that's usually a disastrous thing for a black metal album, but in this case, where you have a guy this talented, it works completely. Right, right. Usually it's, uh, what's that guy? The guy, um, uh, Shining. Oh, Nicholas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but like, yes, the um, it it's a so it's it's vocalist centered. It has I I mentioned during the um when we were listening that you could hear right how much this must have influenced Gendod. Yeah, Gendod is definitely a reference point all over the place, especially Gendod's slower, more DSBM oriented material. Yeah, the way they sound both sort of often sound both very sort of pagan and naturey and also sad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um and, and the sort of uh and the the sheer careening drama in the vocals. Um, yeah. But um Wilkins agrees. Wilkins Wilkins agrees. I think he's hunting a bug right now and he's excited. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fierce. Um uh so now might be a place to get into the um 
the broader point then about DSBM. <clears throat> um, this is sort of a uh, coming at you with an uh, original Terminus hot take. Mm -hmm. uh, the D, like mo DSBM and modern, the modern NSBM scene are entwined at the root. Yeah, and both sounds are at the root of virtually everything that's popular in modern black metal. Yes. And these were both sort of marginal, almost pariah genres back then. Um, mm. And what, what they both did for different reasons was moved away from the chromaticism that black metal had inherited from death metal and thrash, right? And they moved it towards more, uh, yeah, more sort of, we always say consonant on the show, but they, at, at you know, consonant intervals, uh, you know, stern and noble sounding minor scales, etc. Right, and back then they did it with a vital connection to black metal. So it all, yeah, it all sounded scowling, grim, bleak, uh, and the bleakness in one of these scenes often bled into the bleakness of the other. And there are literal bands you can point to as uh, at the root of important for both, right? So we would go to um, the Australians, especially. The first Drowning the Light record, which sounds a lot like Sad Graveland. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also the... Uh, uh, the the other guy, the, the, Abyssicate. The, Abyssicate. Suicidal Every time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like. I I swear, I forgot it last time, and I was like, I remember. I reminded myself of it last night. Yeah. I was like, that's okay. The Abyssicate curse, but basically, suicidal emotions is a on the one hand a deeply indulgent DSBM album, and on the other hand, sounds like um, a Hate Forest record. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um. Uh, and so these these scenes are joined at the root, and the 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 one band that hybridized those quite deliberately and became immensely popular was Migla. Yeah, if you want the Migla secret, it just is, you know, uh, dark fury trem riffs over like uh, sort of um, brooding, cycling, arpeggiated mint tempo DSBM stuff. It's the juxtaposition. It's the linking of those two things. Yeah. B both subgenres sounded... Both subgenres were like regular black metal at its best was epic sometimes, for mm -hmm. the most part. These ba these scenes were both invested in being epic all the time. Yeah. <laughs> which, could, which could result in a lot of music that was, you know, sort of like you know, uh, in the NS scene, sort of maybe pompous and accidentally poppy, right? A tendency mm -hmm. that's gotten way worse. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, for the DSBM stuff, right? Stuff that was just like saccharine, into, just emo dreck, yeah. right? But at its best, it was this focus on certain really distinctive parts of black metal that were not seen as that central yet. Mm. So, yeah. Um, I think that's a good take. Yeah. Well, thanks, bud. So yeah, Kaivum Kaivum was really a part of that moment. Um, and yeah, if you like modern black metal, uh, it's all it's really coming from these. I mean, the Finns had a huge part in it too, but people were gravitating towards that for the same reason that they were gravitating towards you know stuff like Kaivum or whatever. Uh, yeah. um, a, whole, a whole audience was like, why why can't I have the riff that I like all the time? <laughs> Exactly, which, like, I remember back then thinking of as kind of like, oh, no, you can't just have the riff you like all the time. But <laughs> what if you could? Um, uh, so, um, but on that note, let's go to a song that doesn't give us the riff we like all the time. Um, so this one, I honestly don't know if we can say this title. Let's, uh, let's not. It's the obvious it, one, if you look at track. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> it's... Um, We'll avoid the strike. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is uh, track... Let's give them a number. This is track five. Um, and so we get... Uh, we get another sort of classic Kaivum thing, which is this sort of dark, throny stomp riff that's more complex than it seems. Uh, and then we get into some of the structurally unique things about this record.
got sad. <laughs> and and that's the thing that you've gestured to again and again. Um, very, the, our first two samples come from some of the songs that are more straightforward rippers. Even your one, which was more depressive, that was pretty just... Yeah, you it's know. direct. It's fast. It's it's fast. It's still epic, right? Um, it, at the very beginning of the record on the track Pan, you get a super epic riff, something that almost sounds like Migla, and then very quickly it just, like, forgets to take its antidepressants. Um, and you get a halftime moment, and classic DSBM chording comes in. Mm-hmm. Here, right, it's starting to slow us down more into this sort of spacey, melancholy Ulver space. You'll notice the vocalist brilliantly pulls off those kind of Gregorian chant vocals, um, which, you know, almost nobody else can do. Um, he just makes it into, instead of an exception, he makes it into a regular part of his sound. Um, speaking of which, about the vocalist, while I remember also, I spread some misinformation. I'm pretty, I think he's actually not the vocalist of Nordvreid. Um, oh, okay. they, they share members, but it's not exactly the same lineup. Um, uh, but anyway, um, the uh but who knows really so yeah. uh this is um so some other things to gesture to there structurally right like you could say the songs are often structured around the depressive slump right but uh-huh. more than that around uh this general sort of stop start songwriting it connects back to the samoth a little bit it's mm-hmm. like the more slow paced, expansive version of the same principle. There are a lot of places where they use what seems like the most basic songwriting approach, which is just, we're going to stop the riff and start another one. Yeah. <laughs> right? But they pull it off because the riffs all connect to each other. Uh, so that sample does a stop start twice. We get this just, um, you know, we're in this angry, dark throne stomp. And then we get this sort of like chug wind up, which you might think is preparing us for, I don't know, you know, the kind of the epic RAC stomp that all the kids like, right? Mm. And then instead they just start blasting the main riff even simpler, right? Yeah. And screaming, right? It's almost <laughs> like, hey guys, no, this is black metal. Uh, um, but... They're right, you know, uh, Kaivam, unlike a lot of other people these days, have never rejected the basic black metal qualities of this music. Um, and uh, then they do it again. They do the chug wind up again. And then we get this really soaring, graceful, blasted riff. Very epic, very sort of stern, that suddenly turns sad. It does this lilting rise and fall. Sounds kind of like German romantic courting. Uh and then this, and then the tempo falls, um, and it's a pattern that recurs again and again. There's this sort of uh, where nature is, nature is pure immediacy. This record deals in immediate emotion, but also uh, memory and loss, and the sense that you're accessing something through veils and veils and veils. Right. The cover isn't just a picture of a peasant maiden outside a cottage. It's a silent film image of a peasant maiden outside a cottage, right? It's an it's an image of a mass media image of ancient Norse, you know, virtue, 